Hi, I'm Joe Pena, and this is Enlighten Me. Discussions with people on a mission, perhaps like you, who have a commitment to their purpose and the courage to see it through. Today, my guest is Jenny Lee. Jenny is widely recognized as a medium, author, and remote viewer, located near Fargo, North Dakota. In over three decades working professionally in this field, she knows that while truth isn't always positive or uplifting, it's always beneficial to your life path. She depends solely on her spirit guides and the spiritual energy around you to gain information. She gets engaged by people needing help in fraud and missing person cases. She helps people seeking answers, wanting to connect with loved ones who've passed on. And Jenny knows that spirit talks to each and every one of us, but most of us just don't know how to listen. And as a result, Jenny also teaches remote viewing and spiritual classes to help people find and use their abilities. All right. And with all that said, welcome, Jenny. Welcome. It's nice to be here. Very nice. Jenny, I want to cover two different things during this discussion. One is your work in helping people get closure related to missing loved ones. And two is your work with people as in doing readings. Now, I know there's more to it, and we'll probably get into other discussions, but why don't we start with the work that you're doing to help people get closure related to missing loved ones? That seems to be really important work. It is, and, you know, I really felt uh, when I started it, I didn't want to do it. Like, I was getting so many images, you kind of hold back and you resist it at first. You know, we resist the knowledge, but spirit kind of didn't give me a choice. And they told me, like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what you're supposed to be a part of. And so how it happened is I was actually a safety project coordinator. And I sometimes when you're dealing with spirit, you just ramble on about what they're getting or I'm getting. So what I did is I was at work and I just saw the news article about the case and I just described where I saw the children, where I saw the parents and how um, it evolved to and the store in the background. And he called me about two weeks later. He goes, this is going to freak you out. But what you described to me is in the paper right now of where they found him. You saw this, um, this um, news article on the newspaper, and, th- and then you yeah, had a discussion with it. somebody? I saw it, and I discussed it with my boss. Oh, okay, okay. In a very nonchalant way. I was right. just, you know, it wasn't, I was like, that's what I get. And hmm. then he came back and go, whoa, you know, because he recalled it. Now he's seeing it in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And that became common. I would do another one, and they would see another one. And he's like, Jenny. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm just not going to acknowledge what I'm supposed to be doing all the way. So, um, And what you're supposed just, to be doing, you mean? As in doing remote viewing, doing missing persons cases. <laughs> it was something that you kind of resist at first. You kind of say, no, I'm not mm-hmm. doing it. Right. You do have those discussions. But then... It, there was a consistency, you know, my mind wasn't shutting off. It was seeing more and more cases. And then at that point, you just come to a truth situation. You're like, okay, I've got to do this because mm-hmm. I don't think I have a choice. So I just started working on case one by one. But you got to understand, I was never trained by any man's condition or man's remote viewing institution. I did it spirits way. So would you call your common program military remote viewer? I don't work like that at all. I am about going in very fast and giving more details than a normal remote viewer. They get like, if they see a water tower and they say, well, it's a water tower. I look at the water tower, go, I want to know if that water trailer is steel. I want to know if there's rust on it. I want to know what's under it. That's how I work. I like those details. And I describe it doing remote viewing for cases in levels of how you're going to visualize this. All right. So one minute you were speaking about doing this uh, 
at your work, at your full-time job. You were sharing the information with your boss. It became something that obviously piqued his interest. And then you said you started working on cases. Did you stop working there and then begin working on cases? No, I was doing both for a while. I was doing both. I was working in the day, doing my safety stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At night, I was uh, working on cases and um, doing normal remote viewing and normal mediumship readings. How did you get engaged in these cases? Was it with um, with law enforcement or was it with individuals coming to you for that help? It's always been the families. They con- they contacted me. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, law enforcement, they don't want to hear anything from you. They want integrity of who you are. And then as the family presents it and says, I want you to listen to her, then they'll come in and listen. Okay. There's a lot of ego in these cases and they want to be right about things. So I don't step on those boundaries, but I do make sure that the families have a choice to, and, you know, and ask them to enforce that he check out these targets. So that's how I handle things. They hire me Mm -hmm. and they take that information and present it to the officer and say, I need you to check out these targets. Okay. I mean, I, I know that there are other people who are doing, as they refer to, psychic work or medium work, and they're working with law enforcement. So there is some law enforcement somewhere in North America who has embraced working with people with your skills. And I'm just wondering, so so do you find yourself interfacing with law enforcement in those situations? Do they bring you into the fold? No, that's not how it is. See, I don't go anywhere physically. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I've seen psychics and mediums go there physically. And I believe that that tarnishes your ability and your information because it's a remote thing that you're doing. You're picking up the information from a distance. Mm -hmm. And if you go there, your left brain is going to suggest things Mm -hmm. and your right brain downloads the information. And then that's where you start to have two sides of the brain given opinions. I don't like that. Okay. So what I hear you saying is um, it, there's a purity that you want to retain. Yeah. Yes. And okay. And you, before you described military training, for example, that's very left brain, follow this process, step A, step B, step C, step D, very left brain oriented. And what I'm hearing and picking up from you is that you tend to work more organically and allow things to flow for you and not have a set process, but instead, what, immerse yourself into these visions that show right. up? Exactly. And okay. so when I'm doing them, I'm actually, you're my left side of the brain, and I teach it in class, too, that I just turn the left off. Mm-hmm. I stay in the right. I don't attach my emotions to it because I can't be a good translator if I'm a, trying to attach myself to it emotionally. So what's your experience of viewing images? Are you, is, it, is it like watching a movie? What? It is. They're, like I said, I see things in different views. Like if I want to see it very close like an ant, I'll tell them lower. And then if I want to see it like a human view, like you're walking into a room, they'll show me. And then if I want to look above, like down, I'll say giant view. So there's different scopes that my mind is able to look in different views of it because you get different information from different views. And who is it you're interacting with where you're giving directions to in terms of the orientation you want to view? I always call them the light because uh, it comes in like there is a main um, gatekeeper of information that filters and makes sure I don't get the wrong information and um, I don't get confused by it. So there's a big source that downloads it and I trust that source. And then it shows in the detail in the information. But when I get it, I don't doubt it. That's the thing about it. If you go into it, you're like, oh, I stay on it until it, it actually matches up to the information. Okay, so there's two aspects of this that I'd like to address. One, you said that you don't doubt it. 
And I recognize that you're not doubting because you've established an element of trust in whatever messaging is coming to you. Right. You you also indicated that there is a main gatekeeper. So yes. this main gatekeeper communicates to you energetically, emotionally, visually. How? I try to explain it to people because um, you see people say, you know, do you push your, you know, your spirit guide in or out? And I'm like, it's never been that way with me. I believe that this energy has been with me before I was even born. Mm -hmm. Before I was even born. So this is like a massive computer that works fine together. And there's no argument of this room that you have to share. It's just a, a knowing conscience of knowing the information in a very gentle way. Okay. Some, some people would refer to that as the Akash in terms of all knowledge, uh, all human experience, all information, all that we, we've had as humanity. However, I mean, the, the Akash is what I'm referring to is something you could refer to as a data bank. But you are referring to entities, beings, a gatekeeper who is facilitating the transmission of this information to you. Right. So, so that energy has always been there because mm -hmm. um, in my book, it talks about the age of three. And I remember being in my mom's stomach and hearing a vibration. It was weird. It was a frequency. And knowing that I'm thinking, well, I'm not supposed to be here. You know, so having a memory from another place, waking up in my mom's stomach and going, what's going on? What am I doing here? <laughs> and then I'm at, at three years old, I remember this energy going, Jenny, I need you to listen to what we are saying and don't worry about what man is saying. Follow our information, follow our lead. Don't worry about them. Okay. And that's the way it's always been for me. Okay. So there you are as a young child, a toddler, and you're getting this message to trust them, trust it, trust this whatever is communicating with you. Now, certainly being that little young person that you were, you had to feel a certain way. Did you yeah. feel safe? Were you scared? Were you feel like you were, were interacting oh, no. with a parent? I, I was never afraid of them. I didn't go through that fear process. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as that knowing energy that they know you to the core of you. They know you like no one else does. And so I've never had that fear man um, concept with them. Did they feel gentle to you or commanding? Oh, very not demanding. They really present things in a very gentle way and they lay it on me and then they move back and then they'll lay it on again. So they're not a uh, frequency of trying to push something on me or trying to push an agenda on me. They lay it very gentle mm. so I can make up my mind in the path that I need to go in. Beautiful. And have they ever um, given you images of how they can be represented like in your mind's eye, yeah. like physical beings? Is it purely light? So what I have noticed is for them to show themselves at their original form, your veil of understanding has to accept it. So most humans are very um, afraid of things that are not normal looking. So mm -hmm. I got to a point with them. I'm like, I want to see you at your original form. So um, it was funny because I see all these spiritual beings and all of them, and they started showing me these these cloaks, you know, like I have on my book. This is why the cover of the book has a cloak because those cloaks, how they hide their spirit or anything like that is mm -hmm. important. And um, so when they felt that I was ready to see them, they took the cloak off in a very gentle way. And I saw light come behind the cloak. And so it's there's a lot of it's a different white light and then the that's all white and then the face shows different structures of the face 
and uh, a sire energy in the center and then the eyes come through and so and there's such a gentle energy with it when it comes mm, beautiful jenny have you ever uh, drawn um, an image of what that was you saw um, I've drawn a lot of people's other, but the only thing that came close to it, I do have one in the book, actually, they, they actually caught them on picture. I was doing a meditation and I was doing a Skype um, reading and she's like, oh my goodness, what did I catch? Like I just did a meditation. She goes, no, there's something behind you. And it was just happened. And he had the cloak on mm -hmm. and his expression, it's in um in my book on page 80 but you can clearly okay. i don't know if you can see it from here but you can kind of see the interpretation of and it was mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> so and i get a lot of pictures you know and so that doesn't really affect me so it's like this when an energy builds trust with you they know you're not going to be afraid of seeing them in any uh, form that they decide to come in Okay. You know? So it's a relationship of understanding, but not judging. We spoke about your um, gatekeeper, but then you also mentioned others. So there's a collective, and I'm using that, I'm throwing that word in there. I don't mean to put it in your mouth, but there is a, evidently a group, perhaps, of energies that interface yeah. with that. Yes? That's cool. Yeah. Okay. It's good because they all work together in a non-ego, in a very high frequency, and a very, I think people don't understand love here, the way love is there. There, it is connected to everything, every energy, every uh, vibration, and when you understand that it is everything, it's all together. Mm. It places itself all together as one being. Beautiful. All right. Now, so you began helping people. How were people finding you just because they recognized that you were doing mediumship work and then would come asking about it these was things? Word of mouth first. Mm -hmm. It was word of mouth because I worked on this case and I worked on that case. And the only time I reached out to a cop, there was a case in North Dakota, a teacher went missing. And it was really, I was really busy at work and I just felt the energy strong. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm like literally arguing with them. Like, I'm not going to do it. And they're like, just call them and tell them what you're getting now. So I did. And I described the two guys and I described where they would find her in the terrain and the officer says, I need you to call me back tomorrow. If you get any more information, I need you to call me back. Within 24 hours of that, they had the two guys. So at that point, it's not about whether I need to know if my information was connected. It's just I had to do what I needed to do. Right. That was it. Mm, right. Okay. So it's not about being right. It's about satisfying this push or honoring this push that you're getting, this nudge that you're getting that needs to be uh, followed through on. Right. Whew. Okay. I mean, that speaks to something, and I know this is kind of going out of sequence, but that speaks to something that I read in your bio about you mentioning that um, something in there about people not, well, first of all, we're all connected to spirit. Right. Secondly, people aren't used to they don't know how to connect with spirit right do you train people to do this do you have a class where you help people do that because i think if nothing else that's probably the biggest benefit to anybody listening to any of these kinds of interviews at all ever how to be able to trust what you get from spirit for yourself so all i like to do is put them in the corner and say, there's no choice. It's just them. There's no script. There's no pictures. It's you have to completely trust what they're giving you. And when I do that with them, they're amazed 
that they're like, that door was right there. I'm like, yeah. So I do, I blindfold people. I say, I want these two off completely. I don't mm-hmm. want in the way, any process of it. Mm-hmm. And so when the vibration, I teach them to go into a higher vibration and stay away from the lower vibration. And when that frequency comes in and it's at your own tone in your vibration, there's a pleasant energy that comes in. Once that pleasant energy comes in, then they start getting the descriptions. And I'm very gentle. I go, tell me what you see first. And they start downloading. And to themselves, they're shocked. They're like, I can't believe that I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. This is all a distraction that kept you away from your original energy that you can accommodate that frequency. And it's not um, trying to put harm or anything into you. It's just trying to give you the information that you're asking. Beautiful. So is this something you do on a one-on-one basis or is it a class that you facilitate? I don't like the big groups and I'll tell you why. (laughs) Each person is at a veil of understanding. Mm -hmm. And because when you teach it in a spiritual class, that teacher is taking what they understand and applying it to everybody. And Mm -hmm. spirit told me. Everybody is at a different veil of understanding and they have to understand their own way of communicating their way, you know? So, and that's where you get people in a big group with spiritual classes and they get um, disappointed because they feel like they were not understood and that's and you don't want that where they're disappointed from it. So when I work with the one-on-one, this is very direct on saying this. I am not the teacher. I just open the doors mm. and they show what you need to be working in and follow through their path. So you're more of a facilitator in that process. Okay. So I mean, it actually begs a question. How do people get to a point where they work one-on-one with you? Is it in person, over the phone, Skype? It's, no, it's, a, it's I have some that meet me physically, but a lot of my percentages is over Zoom or Skype. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you teach them this, I mean, I'm referring to really doing nothing more than being able to tap in, and to know that whatever you're getting is something you can trust. Right. And what, no matter what it is related to anything that you might ask yourself, if you will, in the course of your day-to-day life. I'm not referring to someone who may, for example, want to learn to become a medium or something along those lines. So is that what you're doing with people um, when you're putting them, when you're facilitating this process for them to help themselves on a day-to-day? Yeah, it helps move the fear. Fear is the biggest part of 3D. And that, once they move that aside and don't fear human programming and telling them you can't do this, this is bad, this is bad, you push that aside and you let that vessel of your soul come in to that balance and feel comfortable with it seeing, okay? And no, that fear can really mess everything up you know religion messes things up Mm -hmm. um you know so that programming that society has pushed on them once they step away from that and are in their own space and spirit knows they're in their own space and that's when that light energy comes in and gives you information in a very soft and gentle way and lays it upon you it's funny because at that point you have those dreams and you remember that information and you're trying to put it together. Okay. So it's a very, it can be a very gentle, gentle way of interpreting it. All right. I know somebody's going to ask me somewhere along the way, Joe, why didn't you ask her if she was open to doing classes <laughs> for a group of people? And so I'm asking you, are you open to I, doing something like that? Or I are you? I am. But mm-hmm. that, for me, even when I do galleries for mediumship, mm-hmm. I don't the demo stuff. 
I don't like the fact that you have all these people that pay a lot of money and come into a setting and they are, are on praying on a hope and a prayer that they get, they get uh, called, you know what I'm saying? And it's so hardshipping, heartbreaking when they don't, because that turns them away. So if I do a gallery, I always say between two and three hours, I will sit there and make sure everyone has some sort of message because I will not let them go out the door mis the misdirected and disheartened from it. Right, so right. Classes, I have to look at it. If I did it, I'd be like, okay, hey, it's going to be a three-hour class then. Okay. So these are in person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you refer to them as galleries. I, I hadn't ever heard that term before. Is that no, like an old I term? Has that been gallery around? Gallery setting, it, say a mediumship gallery. Okay. You know what those are, right? No. Okay. Where a medium goes in and um, decides that they're going to read for 50 people mm-hmm. and everybody wants their past loved one to come in, you know, and they're all in that room hoping and praying that they're, um, their spiritual uh, past loved one is there. Mm-hmm. Not everybody gets a reading. I see. And so I'm saying that's disheartening because it can turn them away from the, in the future on their spiritual path because they didn't get their answers. Right. So now, to me, mm-hmm. have you ever had? I don't like the demo. I want the truth for the people. Okay. So when you say demo, I mean, I'm not sure I follow what you mean by that. So if you look at galleries, they're only an hour. Okay. And you got a hundred people. You can't read a hundred people. Okay. But all those people paid all that money to be in that event. Oh, 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 oh okay. And that doesn't weigh good on my heart to see people leave and they didn't get their answers. Right. I can't just let that go. Okay, I'm with you. So have you ever had a, a gallery where, like, I, I've never been to one, but I'm going to go ahead and say this, like where you say, you know, does somebody here have an Uncle Willie? And then you got two or three people who raise their hand. That's another thing I don't do. I don't do it that way. And I'll okay. tell you why. Because spirit says, you can have walk-in spirits that act like that person. Hmm. You can have completely different spirits that completely act a different way. Mm -hmm. So they taught me, they're like, Jen, now to get the exact energy that you want, all you have to say is that first person's name. That is it. Then I feel an energy source coming down. Um, And then that dialogue, then I start to get the dialogue. Okay. So when I do this, I'm not checking in with the person that's in front of me, the human about the spirit. I'm giving the spotlight of that spirit and letting them just go. I I keep going, going and going and going. And most of them like, you didn't ask anything. I go, well, I'm not supposed to. They have the spotlight. And Mm -hmm. so it's you want the D and A of that spirit that was here, the information, their personality, who they are. So I go pretty far to express their information. Mm. I have to admit, uh, oftentimes when I've heard someone do something similar to what you're doing, they would ask for confirmation. Well, did they, did they, you know, did they do this? Did they have that? Did they wear this? And, and I always wondered about that. <clears throat> and anybody who was skeptical would obviously say, well, yeah, what they're doing is kind of narrowing things down. Who couldn't get it right eventually? Exactly right. But exactly right. It and just, I wrote about that in the book, how to actually get the, a, a very good reading and tell them what they need to do as they get an accurate reading in the book. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I'm not saying that anybody who does that isn't authentic or genuine. Perhaps that just happens to be their approach. So, yeah, definitely not putting anyone down for that. I'm sorry, but I'm on a farm with cows and 
everything else and I can't completely keep everything quiet. Hey, that's okay. What did, what, what was it you said in your last video that I watched? Hey, we just keep it raw. Yeah. <laughs> and yet the, the irony is that you're working with somebody who cuts and edits all this stuff left and right, yeah. whatever. No, it's part of life. This is a mix. Okay. I don't know if you want to talk about this today, but you and I were on a call and you told me about being on land, becoming familiar with the energies in that land, meeting, I think, either someone who worked on that land or owned it, one of the two. And there was some, mm, not treasure, but something to be found and understood there. So it was uh, definitely a landline, a uh, ley line. A ley and, line? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the tale is that there are, were a lot of Vikings in this area. And um, in that process of that happening, um, the thing was um, he bought the property he was moving dirt and they found the bones. They found big bones. And um, the s government came out and told them you can't do anything. You can't move the bones. You can't do anything. So anyway, I knew about it. I never went over there. I finally went over and talked to him. And I did a visual on everything and he knows exactly where they're buried and all that stuff. And if you dig these bones up, you will go to jail, put it that way. And, but over there, um, the, it's a very dimensional energy that comes off that ground because they hear things that we're not supposed to hear. And he's had, um, he says he calls them boar crocs. He's had issues with these smaller demonic things. And then he's had, um, he's seen a family of Bigfoot over there too. And I, you know, I have to really know that something like this is happening. So I went over there late one night and I heard something I've never heard before. He goes, that's them. And it did sound like one. So they, what's in this ground, dimensional, spiritual, they're fighting over this energy that's in that ground. And then part of the field, you can see where that mound is right there. But spirit showed me, they're like, Jenny, there's this outer black stone. And then in the inner stone, it's, they showed me a greenish uh, aqua green in the center of this. So this came down in the ground, landed in the ground. And so for generations, they've been fighting over this area. He has seen, um, and I had another friend too, he says he's seen some birds that are not supposed to be here too. And I've took pictures over there and there's a lot of alien stuff too that appears. So it is, it's like going into a different time warp and um, honestly, uh, sit back and you're going, they all want this source. They all are tapping into this to get something from it. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Okay. So, so far <clears throat> you talked about a field, a mound, mm -hmm. beings that don't belong here in this 3D. I forgot what was, something crock, uh, Bigfoot. Crocs. What was it? Yeah. Boar crocs. Okay. Calls them. And um, Bigfoot, and then also birds that, and when you said birds that don't belong here, I imagine the pterodactyl, but who knows what, what they were. And you being someone who I know, because I've come to know you and your work well enough to this degree, that the things you speak about or work with, you document. Mm -hmm. So... As of this point, do you have anything to document what you spoke up just now? I have a fat file about that thick. I've been working on his case, his property for two years. Mm -hmm. two years. I mean, that would be a total. If, I mean, actually, I could probably get him on your show. 
and we mm. can go through all of this, but this that would take a whole show to go through. Great. So, yeah, there's all tons. All I can say, um, because I do artifacts in the ground, and I also do uh, criminal, um, you know, fraud cases. I've done it, and a couple of those have been prosecuted when I go in and look at something and tell them how they can find it. So I would definitely think that Roger wouldn't have a problem talking about it, but the research that we've done, he's done, and he's tell uh, he's had a lot of interference. You know, they don't want this information out. I can tell you that. Okay. Now, you know, what struck me interesting was that you went from speaking about this and you spoke about artifacts in the ground and then you talked about fraud cases. How are they related to stuff in the ground? Well, they're not. It's just something that when I'm thinking going in the ground, what I have to do and I have to pull something up or something. But it's just another avenue. Sometimes my brain just switches. Um, <laughs> I know yeah, this about you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, which is why it's important for me to understand. And sorry if I'm interrupting yeah, so often. But My husband says, oh, there's the squirrel. There she goes. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned it. You opened that door. Let's talk about fraud cases. Um, how did that happen? I mean, I can understand people now, wanting to see you about loved ones, missing, you know, persons, etc. But now we're talking about fraud. How? Mm-hmm. What happened there? How, how did you make that turn? Well, I had a client that I did mediumship for her. And that helped them a lot. And they're like, we got a different situation for you. And she goes, I got a person in my office is stealing. And I need to know how long they've been stealing, where I can get the documentation, and where I can verify all the information. And these were really nice people. And this person that did this had been working for them for 34 years. That's a long time. And so I sat down with her and her husband and I did a session of automatic writing and I drew out details, where to find it, where to look and all this information. And that was on a Friday. By the time they went through everything, they found everything that I told them. They presented to her on a Monday and she admitted it. And it, and so they turned that over to the prosecution and all that stuff. And they're like, we can't put this in court, but uh, we'll find a way to let them know, that, you know, this is how it happened. So, and that was up to probably a million dollars that she stole. A million. And another one. Was it recovered? I... I think she paid a fine. I don't know about the whole recovery of that part mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, I was curious. Yeah, and then there was another one familiar to the same thing. And um, she, uh, same situation, I sat down and I said, you look at the double checks and they're, the numbers are not adding up. And he he looked at him and uh, two days later, he goes, Jen, I'm shaking to death because I'm looking at all this information and it's right in front of me. She got prosecuted too. And she has uh, it on her record and she did pay a fine. Well, these are kind of unfortunate things for everybody involved. Right. You know, the things a person finds themselves doing. And the worst part is that they're in a position of trust. And speaking of positions of trust, there's a thing called um, a security clearance referred to as public trust, I believe. (laughs) A little ironic because there are people who we have in government (laughs) whose trust is questionable. And I don't mean to make this into that kind of a discussion, but it's just kind of how my mind works. Now, you sent me some documents. And it, we're going, we can shift gears and go into a whole other uh, discussion about something you could call it esoteric. And it was one, I think, that started with the five rings. Do you want to discuss that? Yeah. Okay. Well, 
is around 2015. Um, I was shown information. And when they do that, they present something to me. And this is the thing that I've learned. You know, nothing is an English format. Like, I get things of interpretation of information. Sometimes I don't understand it, but I got to draw it out, even though I don't understand it. So I started doing the download of these, they called them the keys. I'm like, okay. And they told me, they're like, Jen, inside those keys in the uh, setter uh, console of a circle, these events have to happen before these keys will be activated. So there were world events that had to happen. I think it was this one. Yeah. So I got it on my phone too, because it's hard to see from there. But when you're looking at things, you know, it talks about control of mind, you know, and that's on that, the, that format. And it talks about, you know, um, the wealth being part of the problem and then um, sickness in the world, basically, you know, these, and then weather, you know, the world's weather going to change too. So all these things had to happen, you know, and those things have come to pass now, a lot of those events. And then um, energy, a different frequency of energy that was going to be presented to sickness okay. in the world too. Okay. So, and everything about it was control you know, to attempt something, to confine, to, you know, and that was something that was evil that was going to present, that was going to cause chaos. So, And, th and this was shown to you when? 2015. And were you given an expectation when this would be unfolding? No, this is thing. It's weird because it's like an energy. I can be doing something normal and there's this files of information in my head, of course, and they just say it's this one. And I know which one they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I work on all kinds of different cases. So I say, Jen, these things have to come to pass. And I'm like, I get it. So when I, then you start paying attention to seeing these things come to pass and weather and money and control and sickness of the world. Mm -hmm. And once that comes to pass, then you're like, okay, so then you're, you're waiting for the next phase. So then they showed me that these keys had been on our earth down deep in the ground for many, many, many of years. And this is not something seen by a human eye. And so they showed me five in different environments. They showed me they were all in different environments. And those are the keys when they're activated. They're all together and they're all activated. And how that makes an energy for Earth. Um, and then it will stay here permanently. So... Um, so one was the rainforest, one was in the freezing cold environment, okay? One was right by a volcano, that was three of them. One was by the Bermuda Triangle, and one was in the desert. And this is their locations? Yes, as in um, at the atmospheres that they, they buried them in, and then they would come and... Um, reignite again when certain things like that have have come to pass and then uh when they showed me everything they're like there are four there are four natives that know about these and know about the activation of these so of course i'm going to sit back going okay well how am i supposed to find that you know <laughs> that was the everything's a puzzle you know, with these downloads, you know, it's never easy. It's always a complicated chess game. And so I, I'm very good at waiting and patiently and knowing when things need to come together. And even whether it's English or not, I just give it 
exactly the way I see it. And um, then recently they showed me how the energy comes out of there and how it matches up together with the back of that master key, that top key, and ignites those. So after it's ignited, you see those five keys ignited together and you see that energy blow through them. Okay, there there appears to be a cylinder at the very top, and on the mm -hmm. left hand side there's something flaring out of it. On the right hand side there's something different flaring out of it. Right. Is that like a bottom and a cap? A bottom so on the when left. You're looking on the part where it says craft. Mm -hmm. Okay. That end goes to the bottom of that in the center of it. So that. These five keys are one, two, three, four, five. That long piece comes and turns and activates it. Okay. Then you're seeing that that energy go, flow through those five keys. Mm. So and, mm -hmm. that master key is elongated. Okay. It has the energy to start it. Then when those, the center of that touch with that elongated key and turns it a certain way. Mm -hmm. It activates it. Then it activates an energy in the center of those keys that stays on and starts to accumulate. Mm -hmm. And then those region of keys, what region they're in, are activated. Okay. And when they're activated, what happens? They say it's an energy frequency that they are presenting on Earth that has been here before so other types of being can come down into our atmosphere and not have problems or um, it's like air to them. Okay. So it harmonizes the energy for them. Yes. And it's also a light pink. When I see it, when they let me see it, it's a light pink substance. It's very comforting. It's not um, confusing or anything. So, okay. I, would, I you know, it made me feel good when I was around it. I, I think. Does does this master key have to go to each of those locations and activate each one, or does it no. do it and energetically they're all? It turned out. somehow um, they come together at one place because it's kind of above the earth, because that master key is from space. Okay. Say, and then that clicks above, and then those keys go in the regions that they need to. Okay. So, and this is something that's, you know, it's one of those things that they'll keep on, keep on with you until something shifts. But uh, four weeks ago, I had a dream, and they're showing me the keys up, which is means that are, they're on its side for that master key to shift. Like I'm showing right now? Mm-hmm. Okay. And, all right. Now, is this something that you see taking place in physicality, or is it really more energetic or even something that's physical but not to our eyes? It's not to our eyes. Okay. Because, and this is, you know, this is what was frustrating to me, is when they're showing me they're active, and they're showing me, like, Jen, you got to walk on these keys. And I'm like, no. I just had to draw them, put them together, and find out who, you know, who was supposed to, how am I supposed to walk on these? First of all, why? <laughs> you know, because I asked a lot of questions. I'm like, no. <laughs> I do that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then, of course, the same thing with these natives. You know, it has to do with being given this information before you were here on earth and um, and placing this at the right time. No, everything's a happenstance situation. And when that energy comes together, you know, however this is going to be created in that platform, when I see something that they present to me, there's always a chain effect of me knowing that it, it did come to pass okay. so i think it be a big one when that activation is completely done right um i'm going to chime in with an opinion 
Sure. I feel that we've got a ways to go before we can get to a point where we can even embrace the idea of beings from outside of this world to interface with us. Mm-hmm. In other words, saying that we have to clean up our own mess and get ourselves straightened out before we can come to a point where we can welcome someone. Right. And it's an opinion. Who knows when it's going to happen? I just thought I'd spot it out. <laughs> the I end. do believe that the ones that are, are awake, that have done their work, will be able to see. Oh, more. I'm with you now. Okay. All right. I'm with you there. So perhaps this is something that will reveal to those, as you say, who have the eyes to see and right. can take place just like so many other things take place that we don't see with our own eyes presently. So uh, you have the ones that are not awake, you. do not want to be awake. Their visual will never be able to see that until mm-hmm. they, but the ones that have done their work and have worked in that light will be able to see the vision. All right, I'm with you. Now, you mentioned four natives. I automatically went to people referred to as Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, Indigenous peoples. Americans, because they did show me that. And yet these rings are spread throughout the world. Yeah. So what is the role of the four Natives? The role with them is they can see them. And they, their ancestors were part of putting it originally in the ground. Okay. So that was inherited down <clears throat> through. And just like there's some information that I explained to you off air that that was confirmed. And now we're in a process of getting that information together. Okay. Um, I'm with you. Is there, was there any other diagram that I showed that you wanted to speak to at all? Or I feel like we covered the, these uh, keys. Yeah, I agree. People, because when they see keys, they think they're some skeleton thing and these are, they're not anything like that. Not at all. I mean, I would have, I wouldn't have thought of five rings being keys at all. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, mm. Okay. Well, let's see. Is there, I know that we, I, we had other images that we spoke about. One of them was kind of interesting because there, I spoke about you having a preference to do things that also included an element of documentation that you can bring to the fore. And one of them was an image that you showed me. I'm going to share it and you can speak to that image. Yeah, you can rotate if you okay. want. So. This is a lot of the documentations on my Instagram because sometimes when you get stuff, you just, it just comes, right? Mm -hmm. So Spirit was showing me this flood in New York and explaining the levels of the flood and how it would come in. And they said it would come in twice, Jen. It's going to come in once and then it's going to come in again. But it's only going to hit to the top level like subways and your first level stores, it's gonna be all in that area, but it's not. So they were saying they need to go another level up to be safe and show me that. So, you know, it's like, you know, drowning out and all that stuff. So, so I knew that it came in once and it did flood certain areas. And then recently, I think it was last month that it came in again and it flooded those areas and drowned it out that again. Um, and how they express things for me to understand timelines, um, it's naturist because they show me trees. If they show me summer, it's hot. If it's the weather's changing, if uh, spring is coming, they'll express it. But they were showing me um, this is hot weather, Jen. And so when it came, it doesn't freak me out or I go, wow, you know, I just go, okay, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> mm-hmm. You just move on to the next one. You know? Right. So, so, so that one presented. Right. And um, there have been floods around the world, actually, in different places. Germany had one recently. Um, yeah. Italy, I think, uh, different parts of the world are experiencing floods. 
Now, there's a, there's a school of thought that goes along with why those floods are happening. I won't discuss that here. But uh, what's interesting for our purposes, for our discussions, is that you, A, got this vision or got this message delivered to you. And you were able to indicate or at least identify what season that you would be looking at and that it was verifiable to you. Yes? Yeah. And I wanna, when I think it's very close, I really start drawing a lot of stuff. So that's, that's okay. it's kind of, when you get this vision in your head, you're like, I got to put it on paper and write it out because when you download information, your your mind doesn't remember everything. So when it goes on documentation, it, you know, your mind can let it go and then go back to it whenever it presents. All right. Let me ask you something that isn't necessarily germane to any of the topics that we've discussed so far, but there is a um, scenario unfolding around here, here in the U.S., for example, and there appear to be cargo ships that are that are stacked up waiting to port. There is farmland that has been um, had crops destroyed by virtue of agreements uh, made with, I forgot uh, what agency that is. And there's a concern about a potential shortage pertaining to food. Uh, supply chains are disrupted, etc. There's a, there things are setting up for a perfect storm of individuals not being able to get the food stuff and other things that are needed on a day-to-day -day basis. Have you received any information pertaining to that? Because from our perspective, I mean, we've all we're waiting for is locusts to fall next to come and ruin crops. But uh, I'm just curious about that. Do you have anything to say about it? I asked them about that and they're like, it is selling a persona. It is selling an image. And um, what I do know is this plan in effect has been in the works for almost 50 years. And they're very accurate of knowing what they need and what they don't need. The only concern that Spirit has showed me is the inner cities of blue states would not be prepared for this and would have to isolate the cities like they did Washington which is put a, a barrier around the city and filter people but in what does that mean to put a barrier around it to keep people in or keep people out inner, people in the country kind of you have to survive on your own you have to do certain things in the inner cities, they're co they're completely um, codependent on the system. Yes. So people act different and are act irrational. Do you understand? So confining certain people that really will go way off, and then um, certain people of organizing a way you can get food and having it organized the right way. I live in the farm area you know, major farm area. And I've asked farmers and they're like, no, this is just a normal year. I see. Okay. And so you have to look at the persona or what you're saying on the news and what is really going on. Yeah, this isn't something that I was referring to getting through network news. I don't watch that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I like prefer to look elsewhere. And this one happened to be from an individual who spoke about his father having to uh, dump pro uh, crop or get rid of crop. And it wasn't just him. There were a few that were in that. And it was enough to bear credence and, and get you to wonder and to look for what's, you know, how it could relate to why is this even happening? Why would you pay somebody to destroy their crops? when they spent all that time growing them to destroy them. That doesn't because, make any uh, sense. They paid very well to destroy them. That's my point. Why would you pay them? Sure. I would destroy it. If look, here I am, I'm a farmer. I need to keep my farm uh, uh, thriving. Um, this is if I get rid of this crop or if I, if I don't sell this crop, I'm not going to pay my bills. So right. you're telling me you're going to pay me one and a half times my crop to destroy it. 
wow, that's, that's so first of all, something's wrong with that. Secondly, I know I have to pay my bills. Right. And thirdly, you don't want me, you're not going to let me sell my crop. See, right. that's, that's the problem there, the coercion that I'm referring to. So when I look at that, I just don't get this fear energy. And that's when something is very important with them, they'll will set it on me very heavily and very much of a warning. Mm -hmm. And they're not focusing on that. They're not saying that it's an issue. And they're saying some things are presented as an illusion to think one thing and it's actually for another. Okay. All right. I'm with you. So that is not an urgent <clears throat> that they are concerned with. Mm -hmm. They are concerned only in certain cities of it having to be isolated. <clears throat> right. Right. All right. So for anybody who lives in a city, they may have some concerns about what? Right. About being codependent on the system. It sounds the like system and the grocery stores and the bank and energy mm -hmm. and right. money. What's well, it's a pretty good uh, percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. So, and the question is, I think a matter of perspective in terms of how people can weather something like this. Let's say, for example, we had a, a blizzard, a severe blizzard, shut everything down. You couldn't get anywhere. You know, it's, that's something that's, you cope with, it's an inconvenience. The perspective is one of, we're going to get through this. Right. So, however, something like what could be described as food shortages, bank outages, this grid going down, etc., without necessarily being weather related, could really get people into a frame of mind that is not productive or helpful oh, at all. Yeah, that's, and that's why I think they're going to isolate the cities because they have to contain it. I see. It's okay. not, I don't feel it's a, it's a bad thing in perception that I see that they, the, how they would confine it and contain it in a positive way and keep it structured. Mm -hmm. um, it, sometimes you have to go through some bad things to get to some good things. And when people don't want to open their eyes to looking at that, that leaves you vulnerable to the situation when it occurs. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, there's a lot of people in this country that have been looking for this to happen for many of years, mm -hmm. and they are well prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And so you will have a difference of people coming in and looking at it different ways. But, and it all has to do with your perception of what you can handle too. Right now, society is training our children and uh, people. We have, we're very weak-minded. We're codependent on gadgets and instant gratification. And they're going to have to come down and be humble and look at things in a way of, you have to survive. Let's go back to the survival tools of this because you're going to have to get through it. Okay. Suffice to say that some people embrace that, others haven't. The ones who haven't right. may have quite quite a bit of challenges on their hands right. for whatever duration of time we're speaking. And who knows how long that is? Yeah, I don't think that long. Okay. I, don't. I won't fish. You, you, if you want to say weeks or months or hours, that's fine. Your uh, call. If I had to look at perception and what they're saying and looking at things, you know, a 10-day deal is... A, I think that's the max. All right. We heard it here. Perfect. Yeah. Good time to go, you know, on a diet. On a diet. Excellent. 10 day diet. Read books. Read books. Love it. You know, light some back. candles. Right. But, you <clears> know, <throat> I think you're, you'll make it what you want to make it. Mm -hmm. you want to make it chaos and stress and freak, then that's what they're going to do. If you're going to say, okay, what can I do with this opportunity and how can I survive through it? Then you're going to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenny, before we go, I'd like to know if you'd like to hold your book up one more time and share with people what that is and the name of it, yeah, et cetera. It's called Walking in Humble Spirit. 
Yeah. By and you you had it with you did it with a co-author. Is this yeah. gentleman that you did it with? Is he also a medium? No, he is a writer and he's a playwright too, and he's actually lives in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and he's got some really good stuff. He is a ghostwriter. He very 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 good books and and he's uh, awesome. And we're starting another one too. Beautiful. And, so, do, you, and then, do you have a title for that other book? We haven't come up with that because this is actually going to tap into alien frequency too. Okay. So we'll know at the time in that. All right. Well, you come on back and we can talk about that when you're ready. Yeah. If we don't speak any time before that. Yeah. And let's see if we can bring Roger on. That would be an interesting subject. Cool. Yeah. Well, Jenny, thanks for your time. I do appreciate you joining us. Appreciate all the things that you helped. Uh, elaborate for me. I knew I was interrupting a little bit here and there. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm a very confused person when it comes <laughs> to all the time. Well, thanks for playing along. Jenny Lee, appreciate it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>